Hare Krishna. So we are discussing today on the topic of dining with a monkey. So the word dining conveys the idea of settling down to a congenial, cordial agreement of some level. Now what the monkey, as most of you may have inferred, refers to what the Bhagavad Gita calls the mind. So let's look at this. Firstly, within all of us there is a mysterious inner saboteur. Now sabotage means to destroy, but sabotage is a specific kind of destruction. Say if two armies are fighting against each other. So the normal attack comes from the opposite side. But if the opposite side has got some spies, and so there is, there is army A, army B, both of them have got their tanks, and they are fighting with each other. So the B will shoot the tanks at A, A will shoot the tanks at B. But if B has got some spies who have put some explosives under the tanks of A, then even without an attack, frontal attack from B, A's tanks will be destroyed and they will be easily defeated. So, an attack from inside is called a sabotage. So, in modern psychology, one of the most talked about phenomena is called as self-sabotaging tendency. That often, we work out to be our own worst enemy. This, sometimes we see very prominently in sports. Uh, suppose a player is batting when a, now a cricket tournament is going on. So suppose a player is batting very well and suddenly for no reason that player sh hits a rash shot. It is the circumstance, the situation does not require that shot. There is danger in that shot and still some daredevilish instinct comes into the person and person hits the, that player hits the rash shot, gets out and then the whole subsequent batting line collapses and uh, one match is lost. In Hindi says, Jiti Bazi Har Jana. So this happens and later on, not only the, the cricket commentators may comment, you know, why did this person play such a stupid shot? But that person also gets bewildered. What happened? Why did I do such a thing? So what we see sometimes this self-sabotaging or sometimes it is called as choking. You know, so certain players or certain teams, they are said to choke under pressure. So, choking basically means that people crumble not because of external pressure, but because of internal pressure. So that now, throughout the world history, there has been recognized by thinkers there is something within us which makes us act against our best interests. And this is most prominently seen in today's culture, in the modern and the postmodern times. Because today's times, we have acquired in some ways more knowledge and more power through that knowledge than what we had in the past, at least in recent history. So with greater power comes greater capacity to misuse that power. So for example, in America, in San Bernardino, we know there were shootouts where just some people go crazy and with a machine gun they kill so many people and then they kill themselves quite often. Now if we look at many of the, many of the times, if we talk with the neighbors or the journalists talk with the neighbors of these people, the neighbors say, he was just a nice person. We never thought he would do something like this. So what happens is people just snap. So what is it that makes people do such self-destructive actions? So the Bhagavad Gita explains that within us there is a self-sabotaging force which it calls as the mind. Now the word mind has many meanings and some of them are positive. 
for example albert einstein is often called as the greatest mind of the 20th century here mind refers to the intelligence you know he is the most intelligent person of the 21st century or sometimes we may say where is your mind that means if somebody is not paying attention we say pay attention there we say mind simply refers to attention so like that the word mind can have many different meanings the bhagavad gita uses the word mind in a very specific sense so when it uses the word mind it first of all explains that there is a tripartite ontology no need to get uh, agitated by the words <laughs> so tripartite basically means three levels and ontology refers to the nature of existence so just like in a computer setup we have hardware we have software and we have the user so like that there is a within our existence itself there is our existence is the three levels the physical which is like the computer hardware the mental which is like the computer software and the spiritual which is like the user of the computer so the physical mental and spiritual these are the three dimensions of our existence modern science progressed and progressed enormously but by focusing on the physical side of reality so there is physical there is mental and there is spiritual so modern science has progressed by focusing on the physical side of reality and in the physical side we have acquired a lot of control as compared to recent history but when attention focuses on one thing it is natural that attention disfocuses from some other things when we focus on one thing we don't notice other things so as a matter of the whole civilization itself our modern civilization and also the postmodern civilization that is focused largely on the physical side of reality and the result of this is that <coughs> our attention from the mental and the spiritual side has been substantially distracted and martin luther king he said about 50 uh, more than 50 years ago that we live in an age of guided missiles and misguided men guided missiles and misguided men so we have phenomenal technology to control the missiles without but our own insights we are not able to control and the bhagavad gita explains that the mind can act as a self sabotaging agent just as the software in a computer it is meant to enable us to use the hardware for a constructive purpose but the hardware can get damaged but the hardware cannot be used if the software gets corrupted there may malware there may be viruses whatever the software gets corrupted the hardware cannot be used similarly if the mind gets agitated the mind gets contaminated then we may be physically healthy but we will not be able to function effectively so the software is essential for using the hardware if there were no software on the computer i just get a fresh computer with nothing installed we can't do anything with it so similarly the mind is like the software and we need the mind as the agency for interacting with the body in the bhagavad gita krishna says in the 15th chapter 9 sex that shotram chakshu sparshanam cha rasanam ghranam eva cha adishthaya manashchayam vishayanupasevate so he says that all the senses shotra chakshu sparsha rasana ghrana that the eyes the ears the nose the tongue the skin all of them adishthaya manashchayam just as the fingers are centered around the palm so like that the senses are centered around the mind so the mind is the integrator of the sensory inputs and after integrating these inputs they are presented to the consciousness to 
the soul for decision so now the scientific world view it just doesn't understand what all is there beyond the physical why because its focus is the physical level of reality just like if i have now nowadays almost everybody has color tvs color cameras but suppose there was a black and white tv no matter what we do we cannot get a color image on a black and white tv the apparatus and the output are incompatible so just as with a black and white tv we cannot get a color image similarly by material science we cannot understand spiritual truths the methodology and the knowledge required they are incompatible so that's why we need an alternative source of knowledge for understanding our inner side and that's why we see in the world there are especially in the western world which is progressed enormously there are millions of people who are turning towards spirituality and especially towards eastern spirituality towards yoga yoga has millions of practitioners in america in europe and in many other westernized parts of the world so why is this because people have recognized that the modern knowledge systems can provide us control over the outer world but they cannot guide us in our inner territory and through meditation through yoga through chanting through all these spiritual means we understand and gain some amount of control over our inner world so the the point i'm making through all this is that the gita's tripartite ontology the physical the mental and the spiritual this is not just some sectarian belief system this is something which any intelligent person can understand that this is not non scientific or anti scientific this is trans scientific science has a particular focus and in that focus it can give us tremendous power but there are things beyond what science can show us there is of course spiritual science which is a different subject which we'll come to little later but what is taught or in today's university education and what is thought of as science that is material science and it is phenomenally powerful in a particular area but it doesn't help us in practically learning to control the mind learning to manage the mind so we talk about this topic is called as dining with a monkey often we talk about controlling the mind disciplining the mind purifying the mind all this is important but at the same time we have to ultimately live with the mind just as for working in soft the software working with a computer the software is indispensable similarly we need to learn to work with the mind shri radha gopinath bhagwan ki so let's look at a further understanding of what the bhagavad gita teaches so one of the first teachings of the bhagavad gita is that everything inside you is not you <laughs> what it means is usually we think of external and internal you know okay this desk is outside me and there are some thoughts some ideas there inside me so we think of external as outside and internal that is mine that is inside but this this, this differentiation of external and internal is based on a bodily reference point from the body's point of view what is outside is external and what is inside is internal but the bhagavad gita explains that our essential identity is not the body it is the soul and from the soul's point of view not just the physical but even the mental is external so inside us there is the mind and there is the soul and the mind's voice is not exactly our voice we'll discuss about the various the different major voices in the mind later but everything inside us is not us 
there are voices within us which are alien to our essential nature they are contrary to our actual desires and many times we feel impelled to do certain things maybe eat this wash this go here do that and then afterwards we feel why did i do that why did i do that so here if you think about this deeply why did i do that this means there is a i who did it and there is a i who is wondering why i did it <laughs> is it it now these two eyes the eye which did and the eye which observed so what exactly are these two eyes and how do they interact so we will discuss this later but suffice it to say at this stage that everything inside us is not us just uh, as <coughs> in a computer i may want to do certain functions in a computer but you know many times if you browse certain commercial websites or any website for that matter you know we browse on one tab and suddenly there are dozen other tabs which come up they not only there there are some pop up windows which come up now we may we don't want to surf over there but sometimes what happens is not only the pop up windows come up but sometimes there is a ready made uh, multiple choice option with a particular particular option already ticked <laughs> for example the simple way we understand if we are working on a word file we may have a option do you want to save the file yes or no so now if sometimes there is a most of the times the default option is yes and that is good but sometimes if there is a bug in a computer the default option becomes no and if we don't notice it we think the default option is yes and we just tap it and what happens is the file gets deleted it's not saved because the default option there was no so just as in a computer software there are default options which are actually false the default can often be a fault and if we are not vigilant while working on a computer a default option can take us off track so like that within us also there are different options there are different ideas that come up and not all those ideas are our own ideas so we will look at how the mind works as a monkey through an acronym m i n d so misdiagnosis indirection negativity and double role so let's discuss this one by one so it is the mind is compared often to a monkey why monkey because it the monkey is by definition restless all of you are sitting and hearing a class if there was a monkey in this room then what would the monkey do the monkey would not sit peacefully the monkey would just jump here jump here go there go there go here like that why is that that is the nature of the monkey the monkey is by definition restless so krishna describes and arjuna also says the same chanchala chanchalam hi manah krishna the mind is chanchala restless like a monkey so now if we observe often when we sit in a class also you know when we physically sit but our mind like a monkey goes here and there the mind goes for sightseeing walks here there and everywhere and sometimes when there's a joke the mind comes like hey i want the, i want the joke what was the joke <laughs> <laughs> so the mind is by nature restless so it is like a monkey but if suppose somebody has got a monkey somebody the monkey trainer or somebody has got a monkey as a pet then training pets or training an animal as a circus animal it is also a skill it is not that just any animal can be caught from jungle and it can be put in a circus and it will start performing no it requires training and it is not just that any animal can be brought in that animal also has to be uh, handled by an expert trained by an expert and handled by an expert so similarly to manage the mind we also have to become experts and often and there are trainers of uh our wild animals that they know if there are say there are horse trainers nowadays people don't use horses so much but in the past horses were a primary mode of communication 
and when horses had to be they, they use the word breaking a horse breaking doesn't means physically breaking the bone of a horse it means breaking the obstinacy of a horse uh, the horse if it has never seated a rider on its back before it doesn't want to if the horse has been say caught in the jungle and brought in then it has it, they say it is not broken that means nobody has sat on it so for the first time breaking a horse is is a difficult and often dangerous process because first time if somebody sits on the horse the horse will just throw off that person and not only throw off that person that horse may charge and try to stampede on that person also stamp on that person so it requires a expert horse trainer to break a horse and after the horse is broken that means after it is been rid on then slowly it becomes biddable it biddable means it can it becomes manageable and only when the horse has become manageable then it is sold sold in the market or if it is directly sold then the purchaser has to get a horse trainer who will break the horse and then the horse can be used so when uh, just that is the way normally a horse is uh, used but we all are born with a unbroken horse within us the mind is not trained and every horse that has to be broken or a, a horse or uh, every monkey if you are to be trained whatever you know every monkey is an individual and there are certain broad principles but along with those broad principles every monkey has its own or every horse has its own idiosyncrasies it likes to do this it doesn't like to do that so then the horse trainer has to customize its training so as to take into account the individual nuances of that particular horse and train accordingly so here what we are discussing is the broad ways in which the mind acts like a monkey so when the mind acts like a monkey it goes off in various directions but which are the directions in which it goes we will try to understand it here in a broad way and then we will discuss how we can deal with this how we can dine with the monkey that means how we can break the horse and how we can learn to use it for our purposes so misdiagnosis what does this mean let's look at it first so if any of you use the wo word you now many times in any any text editor there is something called autocorrect so the autocorrect if you type something wrong it is meant to correct it so i use autocorrect first time i used it with the editor so i wrote the soul is sachitananda and then i was reading it again i found the soul is saturday jitananda so by its own program sat it thought sat is what it's a short form for saturday so it's now i had typed it incorrectly but the auto correct was incorrect <laughs> so then what i had to do was i had to conscientiously correct the incorrect auto correct so like that what happens is the mind has certain modes of interpreting reality and when the mind interprets reality in a particular way it often has certain default formulas for solving problems so it is said that if one has a hammer the whole world seems to be nails <laughs> if the, if i have a hammer i think everything around me is a nail i just hit the hammer everything will get solved so the mind comes all of us have certain pet ways of dealing with problems so for example if somebody is a is an addict in some way so if somebody is addicted to say drinking alcohol then what happens any time a big problem comes up i think the solution is drink there is no problem so big that alcohol can't solve it just drink now quite often actually that alcohol itself will be the cause of the problem but the mind has developed that particular pattern of thinking 
that this is the solution in any in any this any treatment any therapy the first step is accurate diagnosis if the diagnosis goes wrong then after that whatever treatment we may give it will be in vain about 10 15 years ago i had a severe case of tb and i took almost one year treatment i recovered fully and after that after three years after that again i got severe fever weight loss and similar symptoms then i went to the doctor and the doctor did some preliminary checkup and he asked me how was my diet what was my living and then he came came to very grave he said you got a relapse of the tb now our resistant tb is supposed to be very very difficult to cure in the past tb could have tb was fatal also now also tb is fatal if it is not treated so now already i had a one year treatment so now our tb he said you'll have to take almost 3 4 years of treatment and even then how much you'll be cured we can't say so the doctor was very grim i was very grim and then we were just about to start the medicines and at that time suddenly the doctor actually literally the nurse had come and she was giving me the medicines and the doctor phone don't give the medicines what happened and the doctor came back and he told me that i had sent your samples for multiple tests and just now one report has come and he said actually your test has come positive for that disease to some disease i don't even remember the name now it's a very very un- unusual kind of disease and he just gave me treatment so what i was not able to get cured in one month in 3 days i was cured after that so what happened was there was a mis- there was a potential misdiagnosis and the doctor all the good doctor but still because i had the past track record of tb so the default thought was this must be a relapse of the tb if the doctor had been a little less vigilant and had not done that particular kind of test then i would have may have taken 3 years of treatment and still i would not have got cured so misdiagnosis can be disastrous similarly for us when we are having some trouble when we are having some problem now understanding what the problem is is very important and the mind tends to misdiagnose the problem misdiagnose the problem means it makes us believe quite often that that which is the cause of the problem is the cure for the problem the very thing that has caused the problem the mind makes us think this is the cure for the problem so as i said if a person is addict now currently i am working on a book on de addiction based on bhagavad gita so i have been reading narratives of different addicts and how uh, how they deal with it so i often we think that if you are dissatisfied in life we think dissatisfaction is because of frustration of desire i had a particular desire that desire was not fulfilled that's why i am dissatisfied that's why we think uh, that's what we think is normally the cause of dissatisfaction that can be a cause of dissatisfaction but a more common cause of dissatisfaction is not frustration of desire but domination by desire what does domination by desire mean so there was this alcohol addict and you know see when desires come it is sarva dharman parityajya maya ekam sharanam vraja well a desire catches actually people just give up everything just chase after that desire see often the bhagavad gita talks about we are bound there is bondage and we have to become liberated so we may ask where am i bound i can go anywhere i want i can go to a shop i can eat i can go to a garden i can go to a movie i am free see there are different kinds of bondage there is one bondage is a prisoner's bondage where the prisoner is shackled and that bondage makes a person motionless but there is another bondage that is a puppet's bondage a puppet is bound and the puppet moves but the puppet has no freedom to choose how to move so the prisoner's bonds make the prisoner motionless but we are bound not like a prisoner we are bound like a puppet and the bond of desires they don't make us motionless they make us restless 
when we are bound by desires we run here we run there we run there asha pash shatair baddha kama krodha parayana ihande kama bhogartham anyayana artha sanchayan krishna says in bhagavata 16.12 asha pash shatair baddha hundreds and thousands of desires we are bound by it the desires make us restless so i was telling this anecdote anecdote of this alcoholic how he got the epiphany 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 means realization he got the realization i am actually bound so one night around 3:30 4 in the morning he, you know he had slept at 12 o'clock 1 o'clock and then he woke up at 3:30 he suddenly had a desire to drink alcohol he woke up and he was literally dragged out of the bed he went to his fridge and he found there's no alcohol there he got frustrated then he took out his car this has happened in america he took out his car and went to into the nearest bar and along the way his car sputtered and broke down so then he went out and he went to the al- bar and he went to the bar and what happened is that the particular alcohol brand that he wanted it was not there <laughs> so now he had to go almost half a mile to another place so around 3:30 4 in the morning he just went there to that particular bar and finally he got that alcohol and now it is cold at night he is walking along you know his car was somewhere in the middle he just left the car there itself because because you know the desire is so strong so then he was just going along he took one sip he said it's so cold let me go in my car and then or i'll go to my home and then i'll drink it and as he was just going along with the car with the along walking along suddenly there was some stone or something and he slipped and he fell on the ground you know and uh, he had just taken a sip at that time the lid had just was loose and the whole alcohol got spilled all over his body and then he just was lying on the ground and then he just looked up and he saw all the skyscraper buildings all the lights closed and he thought what am i doing you know i could be sleeping peacefully in bed what am i doing here with the car broken with my clothes spilled with alcohol you know i am really enslaved i am enslaved by desire but this sort of epiphany this sort of realization it can act as a moment of awakening now unfortunately what could have happened at that time if he had, if he had not been alert some level of alertness is possible and it was accessible even at that time but if he had not been alert the mind would have said you are a stupid fool you lost the alcohol go and get another alcohol so the normal the tendency would have been oh i am frustrated why i am dissatisfied and frustrated because my desire was not fulfilled but the cause of dissatisfaction the cause of misery here is not the frustration of desire that oh i did not get the alcohol my the, the, the particular bottle it just got spilled the cause of the suffering is more is deeper that is domination by desire and if that domination can be removed then a lot of misery can be avoided so this does not mean that all of us have to live desireless lives there are different kinds of desires and we will discuss that towards the later part of our class but suffice it to say that actually the mind misdiagnoses our problem it makes us believe that often that which is the cause of the problem the mind makes us believe that is the cure for the problem so this is one of the ways in which the mind misdirects us the second is indirection indirection is a noun which comes from indirect indirect means the subject doesn't speak directly so there is a problem instead of dealing with the problem the mind makes us go here and there and there and everywhere suppose say i am i am supposed to go for a program and then i'm going in a car and the driver doesn't know where to go and the driver takes me to a wrong place and see the program is at 7:45 and it's already 7:30 and you know i can just blast and shout at the driver shout at myself i can get angry with myself you know why did i go here why was i so foolish but you know if i have gone wrong i have gone to a wrong place you no know, chastising myself or chastising anyone else is not going to get me to the right destination okay as soon as i realize that i have got on the wrong path what should i do come back on the take uh, take a turn and come back on the right path 
But on this, if we physically get lost, we understand this. Or if we can say you're wrong track, we will immediately do this. But when this happens mentally, mentally this happens means that something goes wrong in our life. At that time, we, our mind misdirects or indirects our energy towards resentment. Your resentment of reality often hurts much more than reality. So yes, I was late for a program or I was late for an appointment. But if I just keep beating myself up, I'm going to become later. I'm going to become more and more late. Okay, just turn around and go to the program. Or suppose, you know, you're supposed to go for a picnic with some friends, some outing somewhere. And then just before the picnic, I get a flu and I feel fall sick. I get frustrated that why is it everybody else is going and enjoying and I am lying over here miserable on this bed, miserable? Now yes, if the treatment if the treatment is going on properly uh, and we are recovering from the flu, then we will not be in a state of acute physical discomfort. Yeah, the temperature goes, temperature comes, but overall physically we are not in such a, such a terrible discomfort. But at that time, if we are resenting, okay, why couldn't I go? Why couldn't I go? Why couldn't I go? then that can often cause far greater misery than what would be necessary in that situation. Some amount of misery is unavoidable. Now life determines our problems. We determine their size. Life determines our problems. We determine their size. How is that? You know, when we keep Thinking about a problem, stewing over a problem mentally, it, it tends to become bigger and bigger and bigger. But sometimes there are coolies, if you tell them, okay, you have to carry this 20 kg, they will say 100 rupees. Okay, fine, or 50 rupees, whatever, we may give that. Now imagine a coolie is going to get 100 rupees and that coolie is carrying say 20 kg on the head and that coolie puts 20 more kg on the head. See, you are not going to be paid for this, why are you carrying this? No, the, uh, no coolie will do like this. But unfortunately, what happens is, our problem is 20 kg and on top of that, our resentment is 100 kg. And we crush ourselves not under the problem, but under the resentment of the problem. Okay. So, yes, it, sometimes life does give us a raw deal. Well, things go wrong. And when things go wrong, life treats us unfairly. What to do? You know, first thing is, we accept the reality. Accepting the reality is not passivity. Accepting the reality is proactivity. Passivity means I am doing nothing. Proactivity means I am focusing on what I can do the best. The Ramayana and the Mahabharat, the, the, the most defining lesson that they teach us is how to respond to adversity with integrity. Now Ram he was just about to be coronated as the king and for no fault of his he was suddenly sent to the forest you know, there is, he doesn't exhibit any resentment it was something which is worth becoming resentful about but there was absolutely no resentment, he accepted it so what happens, it's not that when we resent the reality we don't solve the problem we actually aggravate the problem so the present is here, the past is here, the future is here. So the mind, when it, it indirection means what? The mind, instead of focusing the energy on the present, the mind takes the energy to the past. And we can't change the past. So in this way, the mind, dis why did I do like that? Why did he do like that? Why did they do like that? Why did this happen? The why questions often are the questions to frustration. Especially in terms of life events, we may not get the answer to the why questions. So rather, rather than asking why this, a far more intelligent question is, how now? Okay, how should I act now? If we shift from that why question to the how question, what can I do now? How can I act now? now our energy becomes constructively channelized. So one way the mind indirects our energy, misdirects our energy is towards the past. The other is towards the future. The future is the source of both anxiety and fantasy. 
एंजाइटी मीन्स वी वरी दैट ऑल सो मेनी थिंग्स विल गो रॉन्ग एंड फैंटसी में मीन्स वी ड्रीम सो मेनी थिंग्स विल गो राइट सो वॉट एवर इट इज द इम्पोर्टेंट थिंग इज द फ्यूचर इज नॉट इन आवर कंट्रोल वॉट इज इन आवर कंट्रोल इज द प्रेजेंट द प्रेजेंट इज द ओनली थिंग वी हैव एंड द प्रेजेंट इज द ओनली थिंग वी एवर हैव because if we think okay now my present is difficult my future will be bright okay fine even if it is so if we dream about a future some future remote future and think oh things will be better at that time yes hope is positive but hope has to be grounded in reality and that rea- that connection between a bright future and a bleak present is based on the actions that we do in the present so the mind if it just makes us going to day dreaming and fantasizing we don't achieve anything so there is definitely learning from the past and there is planning for the future both are important but when we learn from the past or when we plan for the future we are in control where uh, that means we are in control we think about okay this happened this happened this happened what can i learn from this what did i do wrong so if we are calm and composed we can learn from the past and we can plan for the future but if our mind is in control if our mind is in control then when we think about the past we don't learn from the past we simply lament about the past and when we think if the mind is in control when we think about the future we don't plan for the future we simply fantasize about the future and in both ways we don't achieve anything constructive so this indirection has to be avoided and this is one of the ways in which the mind becomes restless rather than staying where it is and doing something constructive the mind jumps here there and everywhere and th- then another problem related with um, the future as well as the present is n negativity so now fear is not the problem fear of what comes after fear is what does this mean there are many times uh, our mind or some of us, we go into too much hyper anxiety this is so few months ago i was in america i was in <coughs> ohio state university i was giving a talk over there so there i made this point uh, that actually the when many indians were there and many americans were also there so i was quoting a, from a book called the anxiety epidemic and this is a, normally we think anxiety is caused by uncertainty isn't it suppose say you have to go somewhere and you are late and you want to catch a local now whether you will catch the local or not will you reach on time or not so when there is uncertainty about that that causes anxiety now relatively speaking in the developed world in the first world as compared to the developing world in the in the developed countries the external uncertainties are much lesser in in india if we in some places if we turn on the tap we don't know whether water will come or not <laughs> if we turn on a power button we don't know whether the the power will turn on or not so there is a lot of uncertainty in the west that level of uncertainty is not there so normally we will think that the lesser the uncertainty the lesser should be the anxiety but curiously it is in the developed countries that the anxiety levels are more than in the developing countries and not only that consistently surveys have also found that when people from the developing countries emigrate to the developed countries their anxiety levels go up so why is it that when there is lesser uncertainty externally why is it that there is still anxiety so anxiety is caused not just by external uncertainty anxiety is also caused by internal instability if if our mind is unstable if our mind is restless you know we can get into anxiety for little or no reason you know, sometimes people get panic attacks 
panic attacks when suppose i'm going along or suppose somebody is going along the road and they say there's a road break over there because there's an accident the accident is quite ghastly but suppose you see an accident you think people start thinking oh what if you know if i'm driving and i meet with an accident over there you know maybe when i'm driving my brake will fail or maybe when i'm driving maybe i'll just get a heart attack when i'm driving and then the car will go out of control or maybe i'm driving and somebody else maybe a uh, my drunk driver may come along the way yes now there are these are possibilities but these are not probabilities possibility means something that can happen probability is something that is likely to happen so one of the problems in today's world is because of mm, instant round the clock media coverage so you know we get reports of problems very quickly we get reports of things going wrong very quickly so so for example if one airplane crashes yes an airplane crashes is a tragic thing but there are, there are millions of planes which travel and maybe one crashes so the probability of something happening to us like that it is small whatever reasonable precautions are there we should take those precautions no doubt so if we are driving a car we should take necessary precautions but if the mind is uncontrolled it becomes paranoid paranoid means perpetually fearful constantly fearful you know if we let fear rule our life we will not be able to do anything you know we are sitting here and we are fearful what if the roof caves or instead of looking at the beauty of the chandelier we may think what if the chandelier loosens and falls <laughs> <laughs> so many times the uncontrolled mind goes into irrational fears yada yaya swapnam bhayam shokam vishadam madameva cha navimunchiti durmedha buddhi sapartha tamasi so druti sa partha samasi so krishna says in bhagavad gita 18.36 that yaya swapnam bhayam shokam so that intelligence actually you know sometimes when people imagine dare devilish situation imagine terrible situations you now utopia is a very unrealistically positive situation positive future the opposite of utopia is dystopia so dystopia is a unrealistically negative situation so now to imagine some negative situation also require some level of intelligence isn't it i had gone to a medical conference and there uh, at a international medical conference so one doctor was telling over there that you know it gives an example of how people get diseases and insecurity unnecessarily so there was a, there was this lady you know, every 3 months she would go to a doctor to check doctor do i have cancer do i have cancer do i have cancer the doctor don't worry you don't have any problems don't worry she went like this for 25 years and after 25 years doctor said you have cancer see doctor i was right <laughs> So now, taking precautions, having a yearly uh, medical checkup or whatever, that is a reasonable precaution. But being paranoid about future problems. Yes, after 25 years, one got cancer. But why live in worry for 25 years? That's not required. So sometimes we need to confront our fears. Our mind has certain irrational fears, and if we let the mind go along those irrational fears. Now, even without much of a real problem we will be really worried we will be really anxious we will become really paralyzed so by re- taking realistic precautions assessing the situation properly and taking realistic precautions we need to move onwards in life the mind has this tendency towards negativity and this negativity can work in various ways i anxiety is just one symptom of the negativity the negativity also works out in terms of scarcity scarcity means the mind always makes us feel oh you don't have this you don't have that you don't have that so imagine so now suppose no need to imagine so after this uh, lecture you are going to have a feast 
So now suppose, here comes the imagination. <laughs> suppose this is a special feast and everyone of you is going to get an individual menu feast. So everybody is going to get different items in their feast. And suppose now in such a situation, the mind, instead of relishing what is in your plate, will say, oh, he has got that. Oh, he has got that. He has got that. <laughs> so, rather than enjoying the delicacies on one's own plate, the mind starts lamenting, oh, I don't have that, I don't have that, I don't have that. This is how the mind is negative. See, see all of us, it's like we could have a feast, individual feast, so like that, all of us have our own individual set of talents. You know, we all have our talents, we have our strengths, but quite often, because of external cultural grammarization or because of our upbringing or whatever, certain talents, certain skills are glamorized in society. And we crave, oh, maybe if I would be like this, if I had been like that, oh, that person looks so good, that person speaks so well, that person walks so smartly, that person has got this. Eh? You know, we keep looking at what others have and we don't look at what we have. You know, one of the easiest ways to make ourselves miserable <laughs> is to compare ourselves with others. Oh, it is a shortcut, a surefire shortcut to misery. You know, God has created each one of us specially. Every one of us is special. Every one of us is unique. Now, what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. What we are is God's gift to us. So we also have a feast. But rather than looking at what God has gifted us, we see oh, what has God gifted that person? What has gift God gifted that person? God gifted that person. We don't have to look at others. What we are is God's gift to us. And what we become, we, whatever talents we have, we use those talents constructively and we can make positive contributions in our life. What we become is our gift to God. So the negativity of the mind comes subtly by making us see all the things that we don't have. Manaha prasad saumyatvam Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita in the 17th chapter, 16th verse talks about austerity of the mind. So there he says manaha prasada he says satisfaction is an austerity of the mind. Now normally we think of satisfaction as an emotion. I am feeling satisfied or I am not feeling satisfied. Yes, satisfaction is an emotion but along with that, satisfaction is also a decision. Satisfaction is not just an emotion. It is an emotion, but along with that, it is also a decision. What does it mean, it is also a decision? So if I have a feast in my plate, if I keep looking at the feast that others have, that emotion of dissatisfaction is going to increase. But if I decide, okay, this is what I have got and I will be happy with this. I take the decision of satisfaction. Then we will be satisfied. So Krishna says that this satisfaction we need to cultivate as an austerity. Rather than looking at what we don't have, we look at what we have. And often if we look at what we have, we will find that we have many hidden talents which we didn't tap, which we didn't even know about. Or we have some talents which we can tap more and more. So this negativity of the mind the tendency, whatever is the situation, look at it, look at it as negative. That is a tendency which we need to correct. And the last we will discuss is, D is double rule. This is among the most insidious ways in which the mind, uh, mind tricks us. So suppose, uh, suppose we decide, you know, I, I don't want to become obese, so I will regulate my diet. And then, uh, we there is a feast and then we eat and we start a decision with the decision. I am not going to over it today. But then what happens? We start eating maybe a little more, a little more, a little more. And then what is happening all this time? The mind is telling one more piece. What is the problem? One more helping. What is the problem? 
one more help me what is the problem and then you over eat over eat and then afterwards you know, the stomach starts bloating and then the same mind says what a fool you are don't you have any common sense why did you have to eat so much you are a glutton so the same mind first makes us do wrong and then chastises us for doing wrong so now if you have done something wrong no guilt is good but there are see, say there is this wrong doing hmm? and then this is hmm, okay this is a wrong doing we are here now guilt should come between us and the wrong doing but when the mind chastises us what happens as is see our strength to do right we'll discuss in the concluding part our strength to do right can come from many sources the strongest source from which it comes is krishna when we connect with him through spirituality then we get tremendous inner strength so ideally speaking say if um, this is if this is it's krishna over here we are over here and whatever undesirable activity is there whatever wrong doing is that's here so the guilt should come here between us and the wrong doing but when the mind makes us guilty now that is pseudo guilt and that guilt comes here means we feel i am good for nothing i am yeah, the mind says i am a fool you are a fool yes i am a fool <laughs> you are good for nothing yes you are good for nothing give a bhakti ha huh? give a bhakti <laughs> so this when the mind chastises us you now there are two kinds of people who give corrections there is a coach and there is a critic so coaches are those who point out our wrong but they focus on our potential for good and they bring out the good within us but the critics or among the critics also there are cynics cynics they just focus on the negative and if we hear the if they hear the voice of the cynics too much we often can get completely devastated shattered so the mind is not a coach it is a cynic so it's it's the minute plays this double role makes us do wrong and then chastises us for doing wrong at that time that chastisement it doesn't inspire us to do right it actually sinks us in self pity now self pity is oh i am good for nothing i am useless i am helpless i am what i'm just good for nothing so one time one devotee came to prabhupada and said prabhupada i am the most fallen person so prabhupada said you are the most nothing so most nothing means to think that i i are that i centeredness that is not at all empowering that is disempowering so even if you have done something wrong what do you do after that to no, get up and start off if we just well oh, why did i do this i'll never do right i am always a fool i am good for nothing so that way we will never learn often you know sometimes we feel i don't have confidence you know i lack confidence some people say actually it is not that we lack confidence more often than not the problem is not lack of confidence the problem is overconfidence in our cynical mind now we have overconfidence in our cynical mind hey if you speak in public you know you will make a cake of yourself you will make a fool out of yourself if you do this uh, you you will be embarrassed if you do this nothing is going to happen if you do this nothing is going to happen so now is the mind a prophet to know what is going to happen in the future no the mind is not a prophet the mind is a cynic and if we listen to the mind we will never be able to do anything constructive so the mind when it takes this double role it actually dis- it discourages us and it paralyzes us suppose a boxing match is going on you know two boxers are fighting and suddenly there is a and there is b and then b suddenly gives a big punch on a and he is knocked down now at that time if he is on the ground what should a do now what is that it is a shattering blow actually but if he has to fight he should turn and look at the coach 
or I should know in the cold. Come on, get up. You can fight. You can win. Get up. But if A looks at B only, he says, "Can I win this match? Never." <laughs> So, if there's a boxing match going on, the opponent who has knocked you down, we don't take his opinion seriously. We take our coach's opinion seriously. So, like that, what happens? The mind knocks us down, and then we ask the mind only, "Can I win this?" <laughs> well, the mind is going to say, "No, you can never do it." So, we all, whatever we try to do, often when we say, "I can't do it," I can't do it. often underlying that is what there is the mind with its twisted ego which means to say you should not do it unless you do it perfectly that's not necessary nobody starts off being perfect nobody starts off being perfect no even the world's champion athlete say champion runner the world's go olympic gold medalist runner no he or she was not born running <laughs> even they began by crawling on the ground taking few steps falling rising so that's how we all grow so often the mind when it does this you know this double role first it makes us do wrong and then it castigates us for doing wrong so in anything that we do if we the mind makes us strive for unrealistic perfectionism and in trying to be perfect we become perfectly nothing we don't do anything at all so there is double role we have to avoid so now i talked about all these ways in which the mind can mislead us it can indirect it can misdirect us so how do we how do we deal with this mind so the what all is inside us we need to understand this the bhagavad gita explains that inside us are many things so there are superficial desires generated by the corporate control media what does that mean many i <coughs> there is a british author uh, oscar wilde he said fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable that you have to change it every 6 months fashion is a form of normally thing fashion fashionable means beautiful but its fashion is a form of ugliness why ugliness is that the very thing which looks attractive captivating today after 6 months when it becomes old fashioned and the very that say hey, you are so old fashioned you are wearing this you are carrying this you are doing this so it becomes a ugliness and it becomes an intolerable ugliness so fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable that we have to change it every 6 months so when we let the contemporary culture define our self worth then we have to acquire so many things oh, get this buy this eat this go here go there get this and then we will can be considered fashionable we considered cool so many of the desires which dominate us many of the desires which create dissatisfaction within us they are often superficial desires they are not very important for us so although because of repeatedly being exposed to those desires again and again from outside there is this propaganda for those desires so because of them we may start thinking these are my desires but they are not our desires they are desires which have come from outside and they have been ingrained within us because of repeated exposure to particular things so these when we start going inward when we start practicing spirituality when we understand the bhagavad gita now normally if we have a mirror the mirrors make people self conscious you know how is my hair combed how is my dress how are my looks mirrors make up make us self conscious the bhagavad gita is also like a mirror but it doesn't make us self conscious it makes us conscious of the self it makes us conscious of the self it makes us understand who we actually are what are our actual priorities what are our actual necessities so when we study bhagavad gita 
be silent. Said, this is not really important for me. Now, this doesn't mean that we should be unambitious and we should have no desires at all. That's not the point. The Bhagavad Gita also talks about certain desires that are natural to us. Now, by natural, there can be two things. We, as I said, we have uh, we have a material side to our being and we have a spiritual side to our being. Our core is spiritual. Along with that, we have a particular body in which we live. So, all of us have a certain nature. And according to our nature, earlier I talked about how all of us have been given certain gifts. We all have our feast. So, when we act according to our nature, then we live compatibly. We live satisfied. So, Krishna did not tell Arjuna that because you, are an, you want to be spiritual, you renounce the world. Krishna told Arjuna, you are an archer, fight as a war archer, live as a warrior. That is your nature. So all of us have certain desires, certain inclinations that come from our nature. And that nature, the Bhagavad Gita doesn't say we have to renounce it. Swakarmana tam abhyarcha siddhim vindati manava. In the Bhagavad Gita 18.46 Krishna says, Swakarmana, by your work. Tam abhyarcha, worship him. Some people mistranslate this as work is worship. But Krishna doesn't teach work is worship. Krishna teaches worship him with your work. Work is not automatically worship. Now if work were automatically worship, then the donkey would be the greatest worshipper. So this is not to minimize or denigrate work. This is also not to minimize the idea. The feeling under work is worship. Is that you know, no work should be minimized. No work should be denigrated. That is true. The dignity of labor. If work is worship is used. The phrase work is worship is used to convey the dignity of labor. That is fine. But if work is worship. Is used to say that there is no need for worship. Whatever you do work that itself is worship. Then that is a misunderstanding. Krishna doesn't teach that. Krishna says, Swakarmana tam abhyarcha. By your work, worship him. That means, we have time for our spiritual side where we develop devotion for him. We develop the mood of worship through our sadhana, through our study of scripture, through our mantra meditation. We develop a mood of worship and after that, we carry that mood of worship in our work. That's how our work will become worship. So Krishna doesn't say we have to give up our work. He says we can spiritualize our work. Do it in a mood of worship. And when we do this, so that there are these desires which are according to our innate nature. And Krishna doesn't tell us to give them up. He tells us, spiritualize them. Harmonize them with our spiritual purpose. And then, at our very core is our soul. And the soul's innate nature is to love and serve Krishna. That is the innate nature. Wherever a person may be, whichever part of the world, person may be there. actually there is, there is a longing within the person, all people, what is their ultimately in life? What is the ultimate goal of life? We all want to love and to be loved. And this longing, when it is directed towards an eternal being, then it brings us eternal satisfaction. So, this longing to serve Krishna that is our innermost desire. But serving Krishna doesn't mean renouncing the world. It means connecting what we are doing in the world with Krishna. But there are often many desires within us which neither connect us with Krishna nor are they connected with our innate nature. So we do them because of pressure from outside. So for example, students may pursue a particular career because that's the glamorized career. Somebody may want to actually have talent to become an artist, but the glamorized career is engineering or medicine and people pursue that. Of course, over a period of time, even within a per career we are pursued, we can find out, okay, yes, I get into engineering, but I'm not so much interested in this aspect of engineering. I'm more interested in this aspect of engineering. 
So when we are living, if we observe ourselves, Krishna says, Guna karma vibhagashaha. Guna karma means actually inner compatibility and outer competence. You know, inner compatibility and outer competence. Whatever is our nature, we'll find that we are good at doing it. And we feel comfortable. Yeah, this is what I would like to do. Inner, com inner compatibility, inner comfort and outer competence. So, like, if we observe ourselves, we will discover our nature. And developing that nature will actually bring us satisfaction, will bring us peace. Then, this last part, living with the mind. What are they required? Distance, determination and devotion. Distance means that because the, suppose, you know, imagine if, you, say you are, you are doing something. So you are writing something, you are, you are learning to write, maybe have your own blog or you are learning music and somebody came along, some friend came along and he said, you are good for nothing. And, uh, actually, if somebody spoke like that, you know, it could very well invoke a fighting spirit within. I will show you how good I am, you know. <laughs> you know we would feel affronted, we would feel insulted, how dare a person say that you are good for nothing. But when exactly the same thing the mind says inside you know you are good for nothing oh, yes i am good for nothing <laughs> what happens is because the mind is inside us we don't realize that it is the mind speaking that's why we need some distance from the mind how do we create a distance from the mind that distance is created first of all by philosophical education which helps us understand that there is something inside me which is not me so we need philosophy and we need regular reminders. It's like I said, a scripture acts like a mirror, which helps us understand what all is there inside. But along with that, there is meditation. It's, there are different forms of meditation. Mantra meditation is especially potent. Why? Because mantra meditation elevates our consciousness. Suppose you know, somebody is at the foot of a skyscraper. A uh, skyscraper will seem to be huge and that person will feel dwarfed. But if that person is airlifted by a helicopter and that person is above, then the sky skyscraper is the same, but the person will say the skyscraper is below. What has happened? So like that, if we compare the skyscraper to a problem in our life, then when we are at a normal level of consciousness, we will feel the problem is so big. But Meditation is a tool for raising our consciousness. And there is there's a helicopter above, and that helicopter throws uh, somebody sends a rope down, and by that rope we are pulled up. Then we can easily rise up. So the mantra is like that consciousness elevator. It's a rope that is sent down to us, and when we situate our consciousness in the spiritual sound vibration of the mantra then our consciousness gets elevated. It gets elevated. So, when it is elevated upwards, we can look at ourselves, hey, this is the mind. So, for example, sometimes when we try to chant the holy names, at that time we realize, hey, I am trying to chant, but the mind is going here, mind is going there, mind is going there. Actually speaking, you know, Tukaram Maharaj was once asked, you know, when I start chanting, the mind runs here and there. He says, why do you run after the mind? <laughs> the mind will run, but why do you have to run after it? Yato yato nishchaladi manaschanchala mastiram tatastato niyam yaitad atmanye vavasham nayayit. Krishna says in 6.26, wherever and whenever the mind wanders, bring it back under the control of the self. What does this mean? That actually, earlier, when the mind had wandered, we would also have wandered with the mind. Uh, so, now at least we are protesting that the mind is wandering. And that itself is progress. Suppose, you know, if a baby is mischievous, you know, and now the baby goes here, the baby goes there, they smile, the ba babies are f just, they, they just don't know anything. If the baby grows up, then the child is become, supposed to become mature. So when the child is supposed to be mature, then the child, the child is supposed to do more constructive activities. And if the child wants to play all the time, then the mother will say, okay, you play for some time, but now you have to study. 
but suppose you know the child is playing and the mother also gives up everything and starts playing all day all night throughout the week throughout the month throughout the year the mother is playing with the child now others will say what are you doing you know you have to make the child grow you don't have to go down to the level of the child <laughs> yes you can communicate with the child you should befriend the child be affectionate to the child but the child should grow isn't it so what happens if we practice mantra meditation we expect you know immediately my mind will become controlled that is not going to work because the mind has a lot of momentum you know no ma even if suppose a, a train is now there's there are bullet trains which are being proposed you know a, a train is moving as say 500 miles per hour and then even with the most powerful brake you cannot expect the train to stop immediately it may take sometimes hundreds of it may go to several dozen miles before it stops but at least there is a brake so our mind has a momentum and we can't expect it to stop immediately but when we chant when we start practicing mantra meditation the first thing that we are doing is we are not running along with the mind we are at least recognizing the mind is running let me bring it back so that is like putting a brake so mantra meditation it creates a distance distance between us and the mind because what happens when we try to chant and then we i want to chant but why am i thinking of this why am i thinking of that when we start realizing where all we are think what all we are thinking about at that time we can understand yes there is really a mind inside me which goes here and there and that realization is also a positive step forward so mantra meditation at the very least it confronts us with the reality that there is a mind inside me which goes here and there and then it gives us the resources to control the mind so first step is distance we create a distance between ourselves and the mind second is determination now sometimes some people say i just don't have any determination actually that is just not possible everyone has determination it is just that our determination is misdirected no suppose you know somebody will say hey, i am you know i have no determination i am so lazy you know i sleep for 15 hours every day <laughs> suppose somebody says like that well actually to sleep 15 hours a day also requires determination <laughs> isn't it say what does determination mean determination means you know there is opposition for doing something and still we keep doing it you know if i sleep for 15 hours then you know my relatives my friends they are all criticizing me why are you so lazy you're wasting so much time and we also have a guilty conscience why am i wasting so much time and in spite of that we sleep that is determination it is of course misdirected determination but it is determination so no one can say i don't have any determination we all have determination but it is just misdirected so what bhakti does is it redirects our determination in constructive channels when we start chanting hari krishna when we start connecting with krishna that same force of determination which was misdirected it starts getting redirected towards krishna and determination can come from various ways the most forceful way in which determination we can get is through devotion shrada gopinath bhagwan ki so devotion wow how does devotion develop our determination satatam kirtayanto mam yatantasya dudavrata namashyantasya mam bhaktya nitya yukta upasate 9.14 the bhagavad gita krishna says that that my devotees practice bhakti with determination dudavrata so devotion there is determination is we often think of determination as a matter of raw will power and will power is definitely important but if our determination is based only on will power and it cannot be sustained for long why because suppose you now somebody has got a stomach upset and the stomach upset is causing loose motions and a person says determination you know determination you know i will not respond to nature determination <laughs> well that sort of determination is not going to work if there is a physical disease determination should not be used and cannot be used to suppress the symptoms of the disease 
determination has to be channeled to take the treatment. Yes, if I got a stomach upset, the doctor says, okay, take this medicine morning, afternoon, evening. Even if it is bitter, take it. The doctor says, no, no, now eat very simple diet. That is, I should channel my determination properly. And then when I do that, then I'll get cured. So, determination is not just a matter of raw willpower. Determination needs to be complemented with the right process. Then it will be productive. Without the right process, just trying to be determined can very easily lead to frustration. Suppose, uh, suppose a person doesn't have eyes and the person says, no, by determination I will see. Well, it's not going to work. Yes, determination you can use to find whether there is a treatment available, go to a doctor, maybe earn the money, take the treatment, do the surgery and then you'll be able to see. So determination, sometimes people say that, you know, okay, I have some deficiencies, but by determination, I will overcome all of them. This is what is the common teaching of many books on self-help. Nowadays, this, as I told, because mainstream science doesn't deal with the mind so much. So a whole industry of self-help books has come up. And all these self-help books, they just talk about positive thinking. You know, there is a book called The Secret. It was there a few years ago. Now there are many other books which keep coming, which say that, you know, just visualize, just think, just positive, be positive. Everything will come in your life. Well, we should be positive, but no matter how positive I am, positivity is not going to stop me from growing old. Positivity is not going to stop me from getting disease. Positivity is not going to stop me from dying. You know, I may say, I am positive. Well, you have positively gone to the next life now. <laughs> so, positivity is not just about imagining something. The positivity, positive attitude is important. But positivity has to be complemented. The Bhagavad Gita doesn't just offer us positive perception of reality. You know, if a glass is empty, to say that it is half, uh, if it is half empty, to say that it is half empty, we could say it is negativity. To say it is half full, it's positivity. But if the glass is empty, then to say it is full, that is not positivity. <laughs> that is stupidity. <laughs> so often, there is this challenge that people try to make their own thoughts, or people means self-help teachers, they often sometimes make our own attitude, our own thoughts, our own mind, they try to make it into a God itself. You know, if you just think, whatever you think, it will happen. Well, it doesn't work like that. We do have to change our thoughts. But changing our thoughts doesn't just mean, say, it's good to look at how the glass is half full instead of half empty. But positivity is not a denial of reality. The Bhagavad Gita offers us not just a positive perception of reality, it offers us perception of positive reality. Positive perception of reality means, okay, the glass is half empty, see it as half full. That is positive perception of reality. But there is perception of positive reality. Perception of positive reality means that beyond our physical side, which is temporary, which is perishable, we have our spiritual side. The spiritual side is indestructible. That beyond whatever happens in this world, there is an eternal God and God loves us always. He's always there in our heart and he's never going to leave us and go away. Madruk prapanna pashupasha vimokshanaya muktaya bhuri karunaya namo layaya. The Srimad Bhagavatam in its canto says that Krishna, he's a layaya, he's tireless. No, he is there to help us. He is there to guide us. And you now Krishna, he's there to catch us. But he is there to catch us not when we do wrong, but he's there to catch us when we fall. Now he's not a fault finding God. Hey, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. That is not Krishna's mood. Krishna, when we fall, Krishna is there to catch us. And he's there to lift us up. We may be unqualified. But we are never disqualified. We may be unqualified. We may have any contamination. But Krishna never rejects us. Krishna says, you never say that you can't practice bhakti. Get out of here. No. Krishna 
always loves us and he's always there with us and when we connect with him his omnipotence comes to our assistance and by that omnipotence we can do things which we might have thought earlier to be impossible for us so the ultimately turning the mind purifying the mind learning to live with the mind dining with the monkey that essentially means dining on krishna prasad krishna prasad is not just physical food but it is the mercy of krishna when we connect ourselves with krishna we connect our mind with krishna that's why the bhagavad gita again and again tells us fix the mind on krishna when we do that the mind will become purified so just like if there's a dangerous antivirus in the software the dangerous virus in the software the virus is removed then the software will function efficiently and we'll be able to do our work so like that the mind which is filled with many negative scripts right now if we focus it on krishna consistently the mind will become purified and when it is purified then krishna says the same mind will become our friend and that mind will assist us in doing constructive things in our life and this change in our inner dynamics you know when the mind becomes peaceful then we become joyful when the mind becomes peaceful mind is currently restless i want this i want that why is this going wrong why is that going wrong but prashantaman <coughs> prashantaman samhyenam yoginam sukham uttama upaiti shantarajasam brahma bhutam kalmasham krishna says in 6.27 prashantam anasam he and the mind will become prashant deeply peaceful sukhina yoginam sukham uttamam at that time we'll experience the supreme happiness so when the mind becomes peaceful we will become joyful and the bhagavad gita and the message of devotion and krishna himself are all there to assist us to guide us to inspire us towards this journey of making our mind peaceful and regaining our inner joyfulness I'll summarize. I started by talking about how there is something inside us which seems to sabotage us, and the Bhagavad Gita explained that that is the mind. So there is the hardware, software, and the computer user like that. We have the body, the mind, and the soul. So the mind is like a software which is contaminated, which is, and it misdirects us. So we discussed about external and internal. We think of it from the reference point of the body. but from the point of view of the soul even the mind is external so everything that is inside me is not me then we discuss the acronym mind the four ways in which the mind acts like a monkey and misdirects us what is m misdiagnosis misdiagnosis i discuss several examples you know satchitananda become saturday chitananda so our doctor may decide and diagnose something wrong so then we or the mind often makes us think that a particular thing is a solution to whatever problem there is but that particular form of short term pleasure that often increases our problem rather than solving the problem so what is sometimes the what is frequently the cause of the problem the mind misdiagnoses as the cure for the problem i give the example of the alcohol addict and how maybe early maybe late in the night he just crumbled on the ground and so our dissatisfaction is not caused so much by frustration of desire as it is caused by domination by desire so the the mind misdiagnoses us and makes us think that oh because my desires are not fulfilled that's why i am frustrated no we have unnecessary desire that's why we are dissatisfied and we are dominated by those desires so then i was in direction instead of directly dealing with the problem that is there the mind goes to the past the mind goes to the future resentment of reality often hurts much more than reality if i have gone to a wrong place okay just turn around and come back but the mind why did this go wrong why did this go wrong why did this go wrong why did i fall sick the flu does not cause as much pain as the resentment because i have got the flu so then <coughs> another way the indirection is about the future so <coughs> if the way to the future is through the present and we need to focus on the present then n was negativity in negativity i discussed about anxiety disorder how anxiety is caused not just by outer uncertainty it is also called by caused by inner instability the mind is restless then we will always be anxious 
and then talk about how the mind has irrational fears dystopia and it can paralyze us by thinking in terms of negative about everything oh what if this goes wrong this goes wrong this goes wrong so we need to that that everything we can see the possibility but we can't live our life fearful of various wrong possible terrible possibilities but look at what is the probability and prepare for the probability and do away with the mind's irrational fears the negativity also i discussed how the mind looks as what we don't have instead of looking at the delicacies in our plate the mind looks at what all is there in others plates so what we have what we are is god's gift to us and what we become is our gift to god and then we discuss d is double role so the mind itself first makes us do wrong and then chastises us for doing wrong so that when the guilt is induced by the mind that is pseudo guilt if anything takes us away from krishna if anything disheartens us in doing something positive then that is not guilt that is pseudo guilt so i describe that real guilt comes between us and the wrong doing but pseudo guilt comes between us and krishna so the mind when it plays this double role it actually not, not only it makes us do wrong not only chastises us for doing wrong but disheartens from doing the thing which will help us to correct the wrong that's like if a person has been beaten down by box, if a boxing competitor has been beaten down by the opponent that that person that boxer should not ask the opponent should ask the coach what should i do so like that we shouldn't consult the mind about whether we can do something or not we need to consult guru sadhu shastra we discussed how mirrors make us self conscious but scripture makes us conscious of the self we start understanding our inner dynamics and then we discuss about what all is there inside us we have corporate control we have superficial desires we are coming from the corporate control media fashion is a form of ugliness so intolerable we have to change it every 6 months so we should put aside these desires and then there are desires according to our innate nature so if you observe what we feel what we are externally competent at and internally we are comfortable doing that is our inner nature and then at a co- at a core level is our spiritual desire the longing of the soul to serve krishna and we so bhakti doesn't tell us to renounce the world it rather tells us to connect what we are doing with krishna and offer it to krishna work itself is not worship but work can be made into worship when we have time for worship and get a mood of worship which we infuse in our work and then lastly we discuss for dealing with the mind the three d's distance detachment a distance determination and devotion distance means that just like a person who is in a in a problematic area the person is airlifted above and the problem doesn't appear so big so like that meditation airlifts our consciousness above our situations and it creates a distance you can see this is the mind speaking so rather than even when we are chanting if the, if you are not able to concentrate rather than lamenting that i am not concentrating you can think yes i understand there is a mind that is what is causing me to distract let me focus and gradually the mind will get disciplined then the d was determination we all have determination it is just misdirected so rather than saying that i don't have determination to whenever we feel sometime from within i don't have determination we should know this is a double role of the mind saying that yeah, i don't have determination i have determination i just have to direct it properly and then last is devotion i discussed how it is not that by our own will power we can change the undeniable realities of the world so spirituality uh, devotion of bhagavad gita offers us not just a positive perception of reality it offers us perception of positive reality that there is beyond all the problems that are there in this world there is an eternal indestructible supreme god who always loves us and who is there to help us by focusing on our, our vision on this world we will fill ourselves with anxiety but we raise our vision to god and that will fill us with security that will fill us with confidence and then we can act constructively and as we keep ourselves devoted to krishna the mind's momentum which is going towards wrong thing it will slow down it will stop and it will reverse it will go towards constructive thing so when the mind becomes peaceful we become joyful thank you very much hare krishna
हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण सो वे रियली थैंक इज ग्रेस चैतन्य चरण को वो इट वॉज ए एक्सेलेंट द टॉपिक वॉज डाइनिंग विथ अ मंकी बट इट वॉज माइनिंग विथ अ मॉन्क लॉट ऑफ डायमंड्स ही हेज गिवन एस सो लेट एज अगेन एक्सप्रेस अवर हार्ट फेल्ड ग्रैटिट्यूड टू प्रभु जीज डायमंड शेड विथ ऑल ऑफ एस बाय लाउडली चैंटिंग एंड द माइनर ऑफ दिस मंक his father is also sitting there so would like to thank him also for coming for loudly chanting hari bo hari bo hari bo to also the guests that have come and all the new boys that uh, the first time those who have come all the boys that they have come for the first time can you stand up all the boys that have come for the prerna festival for the first time so we thank all of you for uh, kindly taking out your time on a friday night generally people have other plans so let us thank them to our family for coming by loudly chanting ribo ribo so please be connected to all our different programs please be seated and uh, we have this regular monthly festival every prayer, every month and uh, different localities of bombay we have regular programs so please be connected so there is a newcomers gift stall downstairs where you can collect a free gift for you and also the prasadam for the guests and uh, for all of you will be in the bhakti vedanta hall the next prerna will be on 18th march 